Mr. Bourne. Good morning, Your Honor, Chief Justice. Justices, may it please the Court, my name is Stephen Bourne. I'm here on behalf of the appellant, Francis Sheehan, and his wife, Mary. With me is my brother, Bill Sheehan. Um, the reason this case is before you today is because we've appealed the summary judgment decision in the Superior Court in favor of the Roach brothers. Um, briefly, the facts of the case are that Mr. Sheehan entered the Roach brothers uh, supermarket, a large modern establishment uh, in Quincy. He, near the front entrance, he slipped and fell on a piece of produce. He banged his head, which uh, unfortunately suffered subdural hematoma and later had to undergo brain surgery. Um, the basis for the summary judgment decision below was that my client was unable to prove conclusively or precisely how long the piece of uh, grape, in this case, had been on the floor before um, he slipped. Could I ask you just a factual question, very simple. You keep talking about tiered tables. What is, what are, well, what is the significance of the fact that they were on tiered <clears throat> tables? Yes, Your Honor. Well, um, the tiered, is, it's in a pyramid shape. So that they're like these market, uh, they call them European market carts. They're on wheels. And then the display goes up like a pyramid. So it's visually enticing to people who are walking towards it. And the grapes were in baskets but overflowing in a tiered fashion, each one higher than the next, like a pyramid. We argue that that's one of the... Um, ways in which the Roach brothers, um, together with other facts, was negligent. Um, that's only one aspect, the slanted display in a pyramid fashion. Um, this particular um, basis of the court's opinion below, that because the plaintiff failed to show how long it had been on the floor, he shouldn't well, even... That's, that's the, as we all recognize, that's the traditional law, and you want to change it. Yes, Your Honor. Into either the method of operation or forget the other one, the name of the other one. But um, burden shifting. Burden shifting. Yeah. The effect of both of those is to, is in, in effect to shift the burden, is it not? Wouldn't almost every case have to go to the jury at that point because the plaintiff would just come in, say, "I slipped on a grape." Um, then the up to the defendant to show how many times they've been cleaning methods of operation or whatever. Wouldn't almost everything have to go to the jury? How would you get summary judgment? Well, Your Honor, if the, um, it would shift the burden, but only in a very narrow sense. The ultimate burden of persuasion would remain with the, def the plaintiff to show that uh, under all the circumstances... The negligent. Yes, the defendant failed to take reasonable precautions against the known danger. In, um, it would go to the jury... Uh, to decide the ultimate, um, ultimately whether or not the plaintiff met that burden. But it's a very narrow sense of a burden shift. It just means that uh, if the plaintiff shows that he fell on a hat, there was a hazardous condition in the store, which is conclusively established in this case, a uh, slippery grape, which all the defendants that were um, deposed admit is a particularly hazardous condition on the floor, uh, and was injured, then it merely there's a, a rebuttable presumption, not really a shift in any meaningful sense of the, of the burden of proof, to, for the defendant to then come forward with some evidence that they had reasonable procedures in place to prevent this kind of foreseeable accident. But isn't your argument contrary to, to all co a tort law? Why should we apply one, a different standard in one little area of tort law? Well, this is a unique area of, of tort law. Slip and fall cases, uh, in almost every instance, people don't know precisely how this, came to, this particular produce came on the floor. So as a result, the way the common law is developed is to have this sort of legal fiction of constructive notice. When one way of showing that is to say, well, it looks like it had been there a long time, therefore they should have been on notice. But no one really knows. So it's, we're in an area of inferences based on circumstantial evidence. So... The but rule has up, developed. Following up on that question, we've got a lot of very old law on defects in sidewalks, snow and ice, falls on snow and ice. Um, is this opening the door, if we go your way, to change all of that too? No, Your Honor. I would argue that this, what we propose, in many senses, uh, is a very consistent with prior law, particularly um, in Gilhooly, which this court decided in 1987. The court stated explicitly. Uh, quote, it is not always necessary for liability that the produce had been on the floor long enough for the storekeeper to have had a reasonable opportunity to have seen and removed it. 
We're only asking that that portion, which is dicta, in Gilhuli be honored in this case. Unfortunately, many lower courts have much more narrowly construed Gilhuli, ignoring that language and insisting that the plaintiff, who after all is bad, in many cases badly injured and is then expected to examine some piece of produce and, and, and be able to determine how long it had been there. Mr. Bourne, I take it that you know, part, the common law moves as times move, and one of the changes that has occurred is that it is now uh, ubiquitous that customers help select things themselves as opposed to, at least in my childhood, you would ask and the, and the seller would reach behind the counter and hand something to you. Surely yes. that informs in part the slight shift between um, Oliveri and Gilhuli. Yes, Your Honor, I would agree wholeheartedly, and I would add that, um, I mean, it, it is ubiquitous now that we see these sort of big box places all over the place that are wholesale type of grocery stores that um, but, but, the, the customers... Say, say it differently. Presumably, you would come in to say there was something about this tiered section and whatever else you wanted to show, and the, and the defendant would come in and say, what we do in these circumstances is we have the mats. We all know what those mats are. That stops the things from rolling. So we have taken all reasonable steps, and the jury decides whether in these circumstances it is sufficient for whoever is selling, no different than you know, Buick against McPherson or anything else, has taken all reasonable steps to make sure that injuries won't occur. That is not changing tort law, correct? No, it is not in any radical sense at all. It is putting more emphasis on a certain aspect, like I mentioned before. The many, not all lower courts have been, like I said, have interpreted Gilhuli and others so narrowly. For example, um, Sylvia v. Shaw's and Anderson v. Rojak are both cases where the appellate division said, well, you don't have to show specific time on the floor notice because um, it's a recurring condition that the store owner is well aware of and, and has not shown that they took reasonable precautions to prevent. What evidence is there in this record that the, that the uh, defendant, Roche Brothers, did not take reasonable precautions? Well, Your Honor, first and foremost, they have a very um, haphazard approach to uh, routine maintenance. And by that, I mean inspection and cleaning. In fact, um, the standard in the industry, according to our expert, is, and it is a practice in many grocery stores, is to actually have a, what's called a sweep and mop log. In other words, a concrete evidence that you are following reasonable procedures. In this case, there is no such evidence. Furthermore, the assistant manager testified that he could only, quote, guesstimate, in his words, when the last time that particular area had been cleaned. The manager it stated... Only, the problem is it only takes a, a minute, doesn't it? You, you'd have to have somebody standing by the, the grape counter all day long. It, it, it's, this, is al this almost seems to be opening the door to a strict liability situation. It, and it wouldn't be just the grape counter. I mean, it would be all the fruits, all the vegetables, <clears throat> all the dairy products, because if somebody drops any milk or, or anything, that, that really <clears throat> has it. Well, according to our expert and their, the defendant's own employees, including manager and assistant manager, not all vegetables and fruits are alike, in fact. And the grape, uh, like the banana and uh, certain other fruits, is particularly hazardous because it rolls and because it's hard to see. And when on a smooth tile floor near the entrance, as it was in this case, it is uh, ex extremely hazardous, very slippery when stepped upon. So, no, it wouldn't apply to all products in all circumstances. But and it Judge, wouldn't require Judge, someone to be there all the time. Judge Spina said almost strict liability. That's, that's my question, too. <clears throat> How, you're going to get all of these cases going to jury. I don't see whenever, where, and in what circumstances a supermarket would get a summary judgment under, your, under this, the test you want. Well, well, Your Honor, if they were able to show that they had reasonable procedures to prevent the type of foreseeable hazardous condition, then that um, presumption or burden shift would disappear, and then it would, and the plaintiff would be back with his uh, traditional burden. And if he didn't have any facts to go forward, summary judgment would be appropriate for the defendant in that right, circumstance. Right, except credibility would always be at issue. I mean, it seems to me the when the defendant came forward with, here's our routine for mopping, sweeping, changing mats, et cetera, a plaintiff could say, well, the jury could disbelieve that but the, and it would make it very hard to, to deal with it, um, to even think about it in terms of summary judgment. 
Yes, but the plaintiff would have to do more than simply question the credibility of the, te of, of the, the other side. They would have to bring, put forth some evidence, either from admissions from the other side or their own testimony, that in fact they didn't follow their alleged procedure. For example, in this case, the actual guy with the broom, the maintenance fellow, he said that we only um, sweep and mop maybe once or twice a day, and sometimes we're not able to at all because we're called to do other things. Suppose they, suppose they had evidence that they come every hour and sweep and mop. I that, think does that get them summary judgment If in their they had favor? a log and, and, and um, uncontradicted evidence of that, I think that would get them summary judgment. That's not the case, however, in these, in, on these facts. But why would that get them summary judgment? Why is an hour between grape fallings reasonable? Well, I mean, how time, do we know how often grapes <clears throat> fall and create well, a hazardous condition? A, a more um, frequent inspection, which only involves a person walking by the area, might be be, um, more reasonable under these circumstances because the way the grapes are displayed, pyramid fashion, loose, everybody knows that they're constantly being opened so they can change amounts. The customers, every, all of the uh, defendant's employees say. I thought these were bagged. They're in loose bags, which loose are bags. easily opened, and are in fact frequently, according to the defendant's mm -hmm. test, testimony, are opened, and so but people can change. But wouldn't this apply them. to all berries? White grape or red no, grape? Your Honor, uh, there's a. Blueberries, interestingly, and strawberries, and this shows a feasible alternative, are actually packaged usually, according to their testimony, in harder plastic that is not frequently opened. So there is a feasible alternative well, that would make it The fruits and vegetables section is particularly dangerous because a lot of the stuff is sold by weight, and people, you know, for example, broccoli, don't flip off the crowns so they don't get weighed with the stalks. And then there's this latest deal. Nobody wants to shuck corn anymore, so the barrel's there to <laughs> shuck all the corn. That's all over the floor. Like yes. a nuclear bomb went off in the produce department. It, it, it's like walking into a, an ambush. <laughs> <laughs> Which part of the state is the justice speaking about? <laughs> Could I ask you on, on a different point? Well, this is terrible. <laughs> um, I think your brief acknowledges that if we adopt your approach, um, it bypasses an important issue of causation. <clears throat> now, you can have a, uh, a, a beautiful, impeccable procedure for sweeping and mopping, but if the grape falls 20 seconds after the last mop, um, you know, it wouldn't have been stopped anyway. So someone might be sort of cavalier about their mopping schedule, but how do you prove how do you prove that better mopping would have made a difference? Well, Your it Honor, seems to me you're, you're a little bit, and I think your brief acknowledged it, asking to accept the fact that liability will be imposed in some cases, even though causation is absent, in order as a trade-off to to relieve uh, other plaintiffs of a very difficult burden of proof on the first issue of reasonableness. Yes, Your Honor. Short of having a video of the event, it's almost impossible in all of these cases to prove ultimately and without any doubt whatsoever that the, the reason the grape came to be there was the negligence of the store owner. That's why we've struggled for so many uh, decades with this notion of constructive notice and, and, and reasonable inferences based on the facts. It's all circumstantial. We don't know ultimately. But that has never um, stopped courts from reasonably moving forward with the common lines, allowing plaintiffs to show circumstantially that is more likely than not that due to these negligent practices, that is uh, more likely than not how the, the hazardous condition came about. So Thank it's not a radical departure to have the, to struggle with that very issue. And that's, that's really what we're asking the court to allow the lower courts simply more flexibility. Or perhaps the best um, approach would be really to leave to, to uh, allow fact finders and juries rather than appellate courts to decide what a piece of produce would look like after a certain amount of time or how much time would be reasonable under all the circumstances, the type of produce involved, the type of operation it is. And as um, Chief Justice pointed out, we do live in an era in which um, customers are often sort of deputized to do everything. I mean, at my stop and shop in Malden, I actually am my own cashier, so I go through I'm pushing a cart so I can't see the floor, and I'm being, my attention is being drawn by every kind of enticement on the shelf. The, the rule that we propose would Look, give incentives. Your time is up, Mr. Oh, Burns. I'm sorry, and I have to leave time for my brother, Mr. Spillina. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bourne. Mr. Spillina, did you want to? 
Uh, you, 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 well, you can you can have two minutes. Uh, I, I just want to address one issue that, um, and that's this issue of um, that was raised in the um, appellee's brief about the affidavit of the expert uh, down below. Um, the appellee states in his brief that there was an oral motion to strike that affidavit, and therefore it shouldn't be considered by this court. Um, there is no evidence in the record of a motion being made. Um, if you're going to, I think, um, move to strike some evidence below, um, you have to develop that argument in the court below, and therefore I would ask this court um, to um, not um, ignore that affidavit. Um, in addition, Judge Justice Graney indicated or concerned about every case going to the jury. Well, I don't think that's a concern as someone who tries cases all the time. Motor vehicle accident cases, for the most part, almost always end up going to the jury. I mean, there are some of them where no uh, violation can be caused, and the system works quite well. Um, with respect to Justice Sussman's concern about causation, uh, what we're asking here basically is that Gilhui be either clarified or um, somehow expanded by the court to indicate that an alternative to the theory of whether or not something was there long enough is that if there is evidence that some industry standard was violated regarding packaging or display, um, that's a theory that can be used to prove <coughs> negligence by the store. Um, in this case, the record shows that the, the employees of the store themselves admitted they are well aware that this particular type of produce is, is, is dangerous and of concern. Um, and yet they store them in open bags and they understand people take them out and, and, and eat them while they're in the store. Um, so, Kilhui seems to indicate that that's an, a theory of, of liability that can be pursued, and we're asking the court to basically expand on that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Spillina. Mr. Hamilton. Thank you. May it please the court. Charles Hamilton for Roach Brothers. Uh, I would like to start with a couple of just a factual points that have come up already, and one is the uh, tiered display that Justice Cowan referred to. Uh, what that is is the, the, the cart that you heard about uh, has flat sections that are like steps almost. So that That's the, very common. This case is not like the Gilhooly case, for example, where loose green peppers were stacked in a slanted fashion down towards the aisle. And obviously when a customer t picks one out, the next one to it could fall on the floor. How Can I ask you a question? Is there an industry standard with respect to the stacking of fruit? Uh, well, there's no evidence of that in the record, uh, Justice Cordy, but uh, I would say that the industry standard uh, is, is, with respect <coughs> to grapes, is that they are uh, packaged in bags, perforated plastic bags. Uh, and Mr. Hamilton, you may well prevail, even if we went with a more flexible standard. It seems to me that this is, you know, classic and tort law, which is, on who, not on whom do you place the burden, but in other words, if, if the um, owner of the store came forward and said, we comply in all respects, and for example, putting those mats to stop rollers may be uh, sufficient in and of itself, um, it, it seems to me we're putting an enormous burden on plaintiffs to, for them to establish. I mean, the man walks through a supermarket and for, for the plaintiff to have the burden under our old case law of establishing for how long the grape has been there is another way, I mean, of saying the plaintiff is in no position to do that. How on earth would a plaintiff know that unless he happened to find some witness who said, I walked past there um, 30 minutes ago and the grape was there? Well, I think this court got it right in 1973 in Oliveri and the cases leading up to Oliveri where it said that you can draw reasonable inferences from the characteristics of the, of the matter, whatever it is, a grape or another piece and of fruit. And a reasonable influence from a grape on a shiny floor is that it will roll away, it is small, it is unlikely to be observed, and, the, and then the store owner comes in and says, but we have taken all reasonable steps. What is wrong with that law, with having the law interpreted that way? Well, I th if you accept as a given... It's not strict it's, liability. It's simply a, re it's a reality. Well, that, that's what I was going to say. I think if you accept as a given that it's sound policy that store owners not be strictly liable... They're not strictly liable. But they, they act reasonably. Right. 
And you, it may well be that, that your client acted reasonably, and it may well be that a jury understands that. It may be that we can't give everybody summary judgment, because that's a way to short circuit something. But essentially what, what, what it seemed to me happened in this case is the plaintiff was asked to meet a standard, an evidentiary standard, it's not even a burden standard, that almost no plaintiff could ever meet, which is how long was the grape there? Well, I, I slightly disagree with that because, again, I think if there had been evidence in the record that would permit a fact finder to say uh, that that grape more likely than not had been on the floor for, say, 10 or 15 what minutes. What difference does that make? You know, grapes, quite frankly, at least in my common experience, take a long, long time before they would change in their appearance. A green grape that's going to look green for a long time even after it falls on the floor. I've dropped but, them on my own kitchen floor and observed this. But so we, it's, it's a little bit hard to say that you can tell by that. I mean, and a thing can be gooey and have fallen very recently. Some people may have dropped it because that outer leaf of lettuce was starting to turn slimy and black. They rip it off because they don't want to pay for that, and it gets dropped on the floor. It's been there for 15 seconds, and it's already gooey and black. That's why it got on the floor in the first place. It seems to me these are very um, highly inaccurate methods of, of proving uh, how long something's been on the floor. Well, I, I, would, I would concede that it, it's, it's not perfect as one uh, way to do it, but I think in all of these cases, the, the ultimate inquiry focuses on were reasonable precautions taken by exactly. the store yeah. Exactly, and that's and, exactly where it should be. Right, and, and all of that evidence I, it was before Judge but that, Connor. But that's not the, the basis judge of Judge Connor's decision. Well, he... He didn't mention it in his well, decision. He went by That's, the old I'll rule. Agree that. He applied the settled rule, which he had to apply. That's his function. That the, the plaintiff hadn't shown it well, was here, on there long He certainly enough. applied the Oliveri rule. Whether or not he applied the Gilhooly rule is a different, which goes to the question of prospective or not prospective. Right. Your position is this is a sharp departure. <clears throat> it seems to me that it's not entirely a sharp departure, and I'd like you to tell me why under Gilhooly this is a sharp departure. Well, in, as I understand Gilhooly, uh, that was what I guess you would call a mode of operation. Uh, or Gilhooly acknowledged that in an appropriate case, a mode of operation Correct. case, there could be uh, negligence found without specific evidence of how long the substance had Correct. been on the floor. Uh, I don't think we have a mode of operation case here because, for example, in Gilhooly, as I already mentioned in this court well knows, that was a loose produce display. I, I understand that, but, but all you're doing is saying your facts are different, but the principle of law is not coming like a bolt out of the blue. And in no, fact, I think and in, as I keep saying to you, your client may well have taken all reasonably and adequate measures. For example, it, it had a tiered cart. It had, am I correct that it had mats? Mats around the cart. Uh, mats around the cart. And the grapes were in <laughs> sealed bags. And the grapes were in sealed bags. And the, and the, you know, reasonable members of the jury may say that's all that uh, is required in these circumstances. Uh, did you have an expert? I did not have an expert. Okay. Uh, the, the plaintiff's expert came out of the blue at the summary judgment stage. Uh, Did you move to strike that, by the way? I moved orally at the hearing, Your Honor, which was not on the record. Oh, so and forget about that. It's your, motion for, it's, your mo <clears throat> it's your motion for summary judgment, correct? Yes, it was. And so when you say out of the blue, this was in response to your motion for summary judgment, they come up with an expert. Well, meaning that he hadn't been identified during the discovery period by the plaintiff. That's what I meant. But did you know when you walked into the hearing on the motion for summary judgment that they had an expert? Yes, I did. You did. And part you, of did their you have his report? Yes. Okay. So you Wait, were so not so blindsided. You, no, but I didn't want to get uh, too far into that expert's report, but it was based on conditions and practices that he observed two years after the fact. Uh, I, don't know, I, I understand. Yeah, yeah, you know, he may be very vulnerable. He doesn't say that the, the real thing that he criticizes Roach Brothers for was not having a sweep log. 
as opposed I, I, I to... I understand that. Mm. The, the question is, what's the, what's the applicable law? Um, and it, it seems to me that the, the mode of operation, which I really don't think is a burden shifting, I think at the moment, if you interpret Olive Ely, we are putting an enormous burden, and as Justice Sossman suggests, you know, and uh, assuming facts that probably don't prove anything. The first thing, if, if uh, the expert had come in and said, I can tell from the squishiness of this grape that it's been there for four hours, and the first thing, first of all, how are you going to tell that until somebody steps on it? But that's a different issue. And is this a big chain, this Roche Brothers? Is it a uh, there's, I think there's 15 stores in Massachusetts. So it's pretty big. But I, I, would, I guess I would say that this is more, if you read the cases that uh, my brother has cited in his brief, this is more of, uh, I guess, a recurrent risk type case rather than a mode of operation case that's talked about in Gilhooly, meaning that, uh, in, and our people did acknowledge that from time to time customers will open bags and will either sample the grapes or change the weight or whatever, and uh, in the process some may, might get dropped on the floor. Could, could uh, I ask you, um, <clears throat> it seems to me that it may be a little bit inaccurate to refer to this as involving uh, burden shifting. Yes. Why can't we just simply make it incumbent on the plaintiff to show that there was some deviation from industry standard, some, you know, to, in other words, to, to prove sort of a negative, to prove the absence of, uh, of some normal precaution? Uh, rather than a shifting of the burden where the defendant's got to go forward. Just make it part of the plaintiff's case. They've got to show what was unreasonable about the way the store was doing it. It seems to me that can be done without any of this somewhat confusing language about burden shifting. I, I think I would accept that in light of a recurrent risk situation. Uh, in other words, <coughs> the plaintiff fell on something that recurrently falls on the floor, and what did the what did the defendant do about it to prevent that from happening? And were yeah, those steps reasonable? The plaintiff, the plaintiff comes forward and says, um, you know, it was unreasonable because they didn't sweep the floor um, every, you know, 30 minutes. And the answer to that is actually that wouldn't help because you have to literally have somebody standing there all the time. So in fact, what we do is the following. We bag. Yes, we recognize that some people open them. But we also put mats around. And I can show you that by putting mats around, uh, you know, that is a far more effective way than simply sweeping up the floor every 30 minutes. And, but know. the plaintiff could bring his lawsuit, could he not, just uh, on a simple allegation that I fell on the grape. And this would be unlike, for example, where you bring a product's liability suit and you allege that the product is defective because you've got the product before you file suit, you obviously have it tested by an expert or get expert evidence. But here you can't do that. You don't know what the store's policy is before you sue because you can't get discovery before you sue. So the suit simply is, I'm the plaintiff, I went in the store and I fell on the grape and I'm injured. That seems to me to be a little bit off the mainstream. Well, I think it's I think And then it's you way start discovery to find out whether they, you know, have logs and how often they check and, you know, how familiar they are with people eating the grapes and all that kind of stuff. That is what I, happens in tort liability. I think the, the problem with, you know, the mode of operation or burden shifting or even the recurrent risk situation where then you focus on reasonable precautionary measures is you could have, I think has already been recognized, you can have the best procedures and comply with all industry standards, but what happens if this thing falls a minute before? And also, it's, it's people, eat, people nibble on the grapes as they go throughout the store. And so that the grape could be anywhere in the store. It isn't necessarily going to be in the produce section. That, that's correct. Yeah, but what I'm saying, I guess, and maybe I'm not articulating very well, it would, it's a, you would create a separate class of lawsuit where the lawsuit is brought. The plaintiff can bring the lawsuit without any real basis beforehand that negligence exists. And product's liability, he's got to know beforehand that there's something wrong with the product or that a warning hasn't been given. Motor vehicle accidents, usually there's police reports, eyewitness, somebody went through the red light, all that kind of stuff. Here, there's nothing. He just sues and says, I fell on the grape. Well, I, I, let's I, have discovery and we'll... But that's no different if, if I go into a, you know, into a building and I slip on the carpet, right? 
I slip on the carpet. And I say, I, I slipped on the carpet and, you know, for, for well, whatever reason. I think the problem with the, both of those scenarios is you're, you're basically moving towards a strict liability standard. Oh. Oh. It takes to start the suit, yeah. no. but it takes more to succeed in the right. suit. Yeah. Evidence of a hazardous... Summary judgment yeah. ...and to prevail at trial. All right. you're doing is suggesting, which I think is probably correct, that this is a hazardous situation, and then the question is whether there's been reasonable care taken in light of that. Right, and but I, I, think, I think it's... You know, we, have, we have decades of, of law that say that <clears throat> there has to be some notice, either actual or constructive, on the part of the owner of the property... Uh, of the hazardous condition before liability can attach. Well, you've just given it to attach. me, namely that, you, and, and I think in a very straightforward way, your clients were very straightforward and said, yes, look, we bag these grapes, but we understand that people open them up sometimes simply because they start to eat them, but sometimes because they don't want to buy two pounds. Mm. Um, and there's no sign that says you're going to be pay, you're going to be charged for two pounds even if you only select one pound. Um, and there are some... In fact, that's encouraged because all the supermarkets have scales there, so you can not only grapes, but you can weigh anything else that's being sold by the pound, right? Right. Little plastic but bags you can put we, into and so on. If we change the law, we'll probably end up with supermarkets stapling the bags or somehow preventing any opening. Well, you know, I think there actually was some testimony about that. You know, you know grapes have to be uh, contained in a certain type of container. The hard container, for example, that was mentioned that we see strawberries or blueberries in would not be uh, appropriate for grapes because grapes need air to circulate and so forth. Um, this brings me back to my first question, which was, are there standards in this area? Are there industry standards, or is this just a developing area? Uh, I'm not aware of industry, I mean, on the, how they're to be displayed. On, on the, the display and sale of certain items, like produce, that often end up on the floor. I think there are industry standards as far as uh, bagging grapes, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, but as far as how they're actually displayed, the nature of the display, I'm not aware of industry standards. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay, you, thank Mr. You. Hamilton.